All right. Thanks so much. Uh, welcome uh, to this afternoon's session. Uh, there's a couple of folks joining now, and uh, I'd like to welcome you all and invite you to attend uh, our Water and Health Policy Wrap-Up tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Uh, we've got uh, some wonderful plenary panelists lined up who will be uh, wrapping up this week's session and uh, discussing topics related to advancing WASH in 2021. And I'd also like to invite you all to attend our last poster session of the conference this afternoon at 3.15 p.m. local time. Uh, please do find and uh, chat with poster presenters uh, on uh, topics you're interested in, and then stick around afterwards uh, for our uh, Water and Health Conference Trivia Night at uh, 4.30 p.m. local time. Uh, the winner gets free registration for next year's conference, which we very much hope will be in person here in Chapel Hill. And so with that, uh, I'd like to uh, get started. I'll uh, end my screen share here, and uh, we will uh, bring up our first presenter, uh, Kavita Chauhan uh, from the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics at uh, UPenn, presenting on a theory-based process evaluation of a behavioral intervention designed to improve sanitation in Tamil Nadu. So Kavita, whenever you're ready to share your screen and begin, uh, we're all yours. Thank you, Mike. Hello, good morning, good evening, everyone. My name is Kavita Chauhan, and I represent the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics. Today, I'm going to present results of a concurrent process evaluation of um, a behavioral intervention in Tamil Nadu called Nam Nalu, which means our well-being. Uh, it is uh, NAM NARAVU or the Longitudinal Evaluation of Networks and Norm Study is a cluster randomized trial in two peri-urban districts of Tamil Nadu in India. Uh, it is based on the social norms theory framework and aims to promote toilet construction, toilet use and maintenance. Uh, there are a total of 76 wards in this study, 38 in each study arm, and the unit of randomization is the ward. Uh, intervention delivery was initiated in February 2020. It's a 12-month um, um, uh, intervention delivery timeline and accounting for the delays caused due to COVID-19 lockdown, the end line is now planned in July 2021. Um, as I shared, the lens intervention is based on the social norms uh, theory framework. Uh, social norms are bundles of expectations and uh, those expectations um, must have an effect on behavior to be a norm. So people have beliefs, for example, empirical expectations are beliefs about how people behave. Normative expectations are beliefs about what, what people approve or disapprove. So the lens intervention um, basically is aims to shift the collective beliefs um, by shifting empirical expectations or beliefs about other relevant people's sanitation practices and sanitation behavior. In this context, other relevant people are the reference group uh, for the ward members, which includes their neighbors and other uh, members in the ward. Uh, Lens intervention has four streams of activities. At the individual level, it includes counseling sessions with individuals and collecting, uh, periodically collecting data on toilet ownership and use through an application which is developed specifically for this intervention. Uh, at the household level, counseling sessions are organized using tools such as flipbook and uh, dialogue cards. And households who own a sticker, are, uh, who own a toilet or, or are uh, reportedly using a toilet and keep their toilets clean uh, as verified by the field workers are provided stickers which are pasted on their um, toilet doors. And flyers, information flyers are provided to uh, give them access to available resources that they can reach out to for constructing, maintaining, or improving their existing toilets. Uh, also, we provide uh, information of, uh, you know, pit emptying services in their ward, which people can um, access. At the group level, peer counseling sessions are organized, um, which includes activities and group discussions, and lens advocates are um, identified in each ward, and these are basically influencers or trendsetters, uh, as you may call them, who uh, provide descriptive norm messages to their uh, social group through WhatsApp. 
uh, and these are people who are connected to them within the ward. And at the ward level, uh, community mobilization efforts are organized. <clears throat> these include sessions, uh, small group sessions, uh, mass media, uh, mass uh, audio announcements to mobilize people, and wall paintings, um, basically four to six wall paintings per ward, per ward which uh, kind of broadcast the descriptive norm around toilet ownership and toilet use in each ward. So um, as you can see in the next slide, um, uh, according to theory of change, uh, we not only provide um, information on descriptive norms, but it, the intervention also aims to provide action-oriented information to help individuals set goals for themselves and to overcome the perceived barriers related to toilet construction and use. For example, the intervention not only does norm signaling around what the significant others are doing, but it also tries to build people's capacity by providing them access to resources, which is financial resources, to tell them where to buy material resources from, and also uh, increase their social network and social support of significant others who are constructing, building, and using toilets. Uh, the aim of this pro concurrent process evaluation is to you know, document the inter intervention delivery process. Um, so basically, we, our objective is to identify what really happened compared to what was supposed to happen, which is the fidelity. Uh, it will also provide us an opportunity to reflect on the intermediate steps along the causal pathway and will help us assess how, why, or why not the intervention caused intended or unintended uh, outcomes. The process evaluation is informed by the Medical Research Council UK guidance uh, for conducting process evaluations and the Behaviour Centre Design Framework, uh, which was developed at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So in this uh, slide, um, at the top, you see the Behaviour Centre Design Theory of Change, which is a scientifically founded uh, theory of behaviour determination and reflects reinforcement learning model. It assumes uh, that an intervention uh, must change something within the behavioural setting or the environment. And this should lead to changes in the way the behavior is perceived by the brain or the body. And that should result in selection and repeated performance of the desired behavior. Evaluation process evaluation will be done across uh, four key domains. Um, we will assess the context of the government program uh, under the new ODF plus phase of Swachh Bharat mission or the Clean India mission. We will also assess the situational factors which interact with the intervention, and these are factors which are outside the intervention. Uh, we will assess the inputs that are deployed, which includes human material financial resources and, and any, any other form of input which help the intervention delivery. Implementation will be assessed by um, measuring fidelity, uh, uh, which is how faithful was the intervention to the original plan the intensity, which is the quantity and the quality of intervention delivered. We will also look at uh, community, community mobilization strategies um, and the participant recruitment process in the intervention. What was done, what were the challenges faced and you know what were the enabling factors in that process and participant engagement, which is basically how did the participants engage or interact with the intervention in the behavior setting. We will also assess the pathways to change. Um, basically, we will look at if the intervention component resonated with the target audience. Was it surprising? Was it appealing? Uh, did the participants actively mention aspects related to the uh, descriptive norms which were broadcast or which were disseminating during the intervention delivery? Uh, and what are their views on toilet construction, use, maintenance, and how does it relate to the behavioral motives that the intervention aims to address, which is around affiliation, comfort, and convenience related to toilet use. And do uh, participants report construction uh, of toilets and possible changes in toilet use norms in their boards? Um, this is an ongoing process evaluation. And once the impact evaluation is done, uh, we will know if the intervention was effective in improving um, behaviors. If yes, is it scalable and what adaptations are required? If not, uh, what are the reasons and why did it not work? We will also assess any unintended consequences, positive or negative, um, that happen uh, you know, during the course of this uh, intervention. 
this is a mixed method study and uh, we are using methods such as document review, in-depth interviews, um, uh, focus group discussions, and we are also conducting um, survey during the end line to assess exposure, acceptability, and of course, reach. Today, I'm going to present results of um, interviews with uh, 80 individuals who were ex households who were exposed to the intervention and a focus group discussion with motivators. Motivators are basically the field functionaries who are responsible for delivering the intervention to the target audience and review of activity logs and campaign for photograph, which is done on an ongoing basis. So as we all know, India was declared open defecation free in <clears throat> August 20, uh, in October 2019, and LENS was launched in February 2020, which meant that um, most households in Tamil Nadu and different parts of India already had toilet and toilet coverage had improved during the course of Swachh Bharat mission. In Tamil Nadu, we found that toilet coverage in, in the study was, wards was between 17 to, 70 to 80%. And uh, toilet use was reported high among households who owned a private toilet or among households you, who used a public toilet. Thus, uh, the approach adopted by this intervention and the narrative uh, of this intervention was not about open defecation practices, but the intervention um, disseminated messages such as, do you know seven out of 10 households in your ward own a toilet? Or do you know- One minute eight, left. Eight out of 10 households in your ward uh, use a toilet every time. Don't be left behind. To build a toilet, contact your lens motivator and we also provided the contact coordinates of the lens motivator. Um, there was a huge amount of political unrest during the beginning of this year because of the Citizens Amendment Act discourse, uh, which really affected Muslim communities uh, across India and especially also in the wards, um, uh, which were part of the study. Thus, the team had to uh, initiate some trust building efforts to mobilize uh, community members and also supplement the objectives of the Swachh Bharat mission, which were to ensure toilet use is sustained and um, toilet uh, toilets are maintained for use. Um, delivery of this intervention was also interrupted by the nationwide lockdown. However, uh, to a, during that time, the government approached the intervention to um, seek help uh, for this uh, disseminating COVID-19 related relief measures. Therefore, the outreach workers took this opportunity to maintain their contact with the communities, uh, although they did not disseminate any lens related information during this time, but it helped in building a healthy rapport with the community. Um, therefore, we had to also adapt our intervention delivery given the context um, uh, at that point. Mass gatherings were avoided and home visits were organized uh, following the COVID protocols and small poster sessions were also conducted. We also identified community advocates during this time who then disseminated the descriptive norm messages through WhatsApp groups to other community members and they were monitored by the implementing agency. We found that there was a lot of excitement among uh, the participants about lens stickers. Uh, they felt that there was, you know, it provided them social recognition. Uh, there were several households who actually laminated these stickers and pasted them on their uh, front door instead of the toilet. And there were other households who demanded these stickers and, and committed to the health workers that next time when they visit, they will make sure that their, their toilets are clean and they are well maintained so that they can also obtain these stickers. Each sticker stood for, the pink stood for toilet ownership, green for toilet use, and blue for toilet maintenance and cleanliness. Delivery strategies, since they were amended, there were some uneven, uh, they were delivered in an uneven format in some wards. Uh, however, the core elements and core messages of the uh, delivery were retained. For example, small group sessions and home visits were organized and the numbers of these group sessions and visits was increased, but it also meant that the time spent by worker in each household was reduced. At the, uh, End of this phase in, in the past six months, we found that more than 112 uh, new toilets were constructed and many more households committed to constructing toilets 
and these were reportedly inspired by lens motivators. There was an increased awareness among the households about accessing resources to use to build a toilet. However, we also found that uh, a lot of uh, public toilets were reportedly in use in Karur, where um, individual household toilets coverage is lower. However, the toilet construction costs varied between 10,000 to 150,000 Indian rupees. And reasons for toilet use include comfort, convenience, status, and many were building because their neighbors and other ward members were building, which confirms the descriptive norm messaging. And of course- oh, uh, Kavit, uh, please do try to uh, wrap up in the next few seconds if you can. I see we've got a, a few questions coming in. It'd be nice to have time for those. Okay. Uh, so in conclusion, we believe that it is really important to have a core uh, theory of change, but uh, adaptations are important and they should be customized uh, in these interventions of this nature as context really plays an important role. Due to COVID-19 outbreak, there was an increased risk perception, which meant there was better acceptance of toilets, but there was also fear among public toilet users, which may mean that maybe they've gone back to open defecation. And the concept did kind of resonate with people and continued interaction and engagement with the community did reinforce the trust and level of dependencies in this relationship. And we hope that this will be beneficial for the intervention. I'd like to acknowledge the participants of this study, our partners, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for funding this study and the UNC Water and Health Conference for providing us this platform. Thank you. All right, well, thanks uh, very much again, Kavita. Um, really interesting work um, and uh, we've got another one coming up on uh, 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 Swatch about our admission as well. First question here uh, from uh, Stephanie Sangalan is, um, can you please describe what kinds of methods and processes will be used to evaluate intervention fidelity? And will this be a one-time assessment or will there be periodic assessments of fidelity? Thanks for your question. So um, intervention fidelity, uh, there's no standard method, but you know, we are basically looking at adherence to the intervention protocol. We are also looking at the quality of intervention delivery. So uh, adherence to the intervention protocol will be assessed by, you know, looking at activity logs, looking at the number of activities that were uh, conducted as per plan. A quality of assessment will be done through unstructured, um, uh, through uh, structured observations. Unfortunately, we could not do it because we, we could not visit the field in the past uh, um, couple of months, but we hope to do it, you know, in near future. Um, also, we will uh, look at uh, in intensity and fidelity. We, we will measure closely because fidelity will also mean uh, the number of sessions or, or the number of um, events that were organized and the number of people who came in contact with these uh, events or these activities. And, it, and it's an ongoing process. You know, we, we are collecting that data on an ongoing basis. Great, thanks. And uh, one last question from uh, Jan Willen Rosenboom. Uh, it says, thanks. Uh, can you please explain a little more about the difference between the lens approach and a regular BCC campaign? And this is the last question we'll have time for verbally, uh, but uh, if there's others, you can respond in uh, the uh, platform. So uh, a regular BCC campaign may have a, a certain focus or, or a certain motive that it addresses. For example, it may address personal motives, it may address, say, people's access to resources. In this particular campaign, we are addressing the norms around toilet use, and especially we are looking at shifting perceptions around the empirical expectations. So we are providing people a reference group, and that reference group is within their community, and we are telling people that seven out of 10 people, and these are like, real. this is real data, this data has come from, through our earlier assessment in their specific wards. So we are telling people, we are giving them relatable information to say that seven out of 10 people in your ward are constructing a toilet. Don't be left behind. So, so we in this campaign are looking at using norm-centric messaging to change behavior. All right, well, thanks again very much for that wonderful presentation. Uh, and uh, now we'd like to uh, introduce our uh, second presenter, uh, Charlotte Lane from uh, 3IE, the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, will be uh, presenting her work on the use of behavioral science-informed interventions to promote latrine use in rural India, a synthesis of findings. Great, thanks. Uh, I hope you all can see my screen. Um, and I'm going to be presenting this work 
on our uh, grant window to support Latrinos in rural India and the findings that we have coming out of it. So briefly, an introduction to 3IE. The International Initiative for Impact Evaluation is a membership-based not-for-profit with three primary goals. We strongly advocate for the generation and use of evidence. We believe in fostering conversations and building a culture of evaluation. In doing this, we support innovation in the field of evidence synthesis and impact evaluation, and we provide standards regarding the quality of these works. We also produce knowledge and public goods. We host an evidence repository that includes comprehensive databases of impact evaluations and systematic reviews. We also publish academic works, reports, and briefs of the studies we support and carry out. So now to the topic at hand. Back in 2014, just 39% of India was considered open defecation free. To address this problem, the world's largest sanitation campaign was launched. The Swashbrat mission successfully built a massive number of toilets. However, the increase in toilet access does not necessarily translate to an increase in use. Therefore, in 2016, as the Swashbrat mission was being implemented, we wanted to support the generation of useful evidence regarding how to encourage the behavior of latrine use among those who already had latrines. 3IE partnered with the Research Institute for Compassionate Economics and started the Promoting Latrine Use in Rural India Evidence Program with support from the Gates Foundation. The aim of this program was to generate evidence on the effectiveness of low cost behavioral science informed interventions to improve latrine use. We also wanted to explore how latrine use could be rigorously measured. In the first phase of this program, we carried out a scoping study, which showed that there are several behavioral factors, including cultural and social norms, that prevent people from using the toilet, even if they have access. Going out in the open with fresh air is seen as cleaner than using a stuffy, smelly toilet. Latrines may not be used because there is fear of the latrine pit filling up and dealing with the problem of cleaning it. In this phase, we had eight teams carry out pilots of behavioral interventions in seven states. Latrine coverage, use, and barriers to use varied across states. Therefore, each team developed their own set of activities to address these barriers in the way that they thought would be most effective in the local context. We then selected four teams to carry out impact evaluations in four states. They tested different interventions to support use among households that owned latrines. What was unique was that the four teams collaborated and came up with a common set of latrine use questions that were measured in all studies, both before and after the intervention. The development of this common set of indicators was an extensive collaborative process among the four teams, 3IE and RICE. This process included members of Indian research institutions and international sanitation and behavioral science experts. It resulted in a unique opportunity because we developed a data set that includes the same indicators for several different behavioral science informed interventions in several different contexts. This allows us to conduct comparative analysis and also to estimate mean effects. We can make generalizable conclusions about the impacts of these types of interventions. It is the use of this common set of indicators that makes the grant window unique. We also had an independent measurement team that worked with a subsample in each of the four project areas to test the validity of the latrine use measures using different tools. We included observational indicators of the state of the latrine use, such as if the latrine was clogged with dirt or leaves, which would indicate non-use, and the presence of a mug, cleaning supplies, and slippers, which would indicate use. These were used to make a latrine observation index reflecting the if characteristic signs of latrine use were present. The survey questions were asked of each individual in the household and not just the head of the household, as is the norm in most surveys. We paid explicit attention to the issue of bias in the phrasing of the questions, thinking about issues like sequencing. For example, the question about latrine ownership was asked along with questions about the ownership of other assets, rather than along with the question about latrine use. Teams asked about latrine use after looking at the latrine for evidence of use. We also collected data on the type of latrine and the latrine pit. So the four teams implemented their different behavioral science informed interventions based on somewhat different approaches. All four teams used cluster randomization to allow for the comparison of effects in intervention and control sites. However, each team developed their own theory and set of activities. In Bihar, OPML and World Vision based their intervention on nudge theory. 
In Odisha, Amaria and Rural Welfare Institute based their intervention on the concept of risk perceptions, ability, social norms, motivation, opportunity, and self-regulation. EWAG and Water Aid India used a similar approach, the RANAS intervention in Karnataka. LSHTM and IAPHG2 use behavior-centered design in Gujarat. For the synthesis of the four studies, we used a difference in difference approach to consider the impacts of the intervention on self-reported latrine use and the latrine observation index. The difference in difference approach allowed us to, est to consider the change in latrine use and control sites, which was likely due to SBN, and compare it to the change in latrine use in intervention sites. The additional increase in intervention sites beyond what was seen in control sites is considered to be the intervention effect. It is reflected by the beta three in the equation here. We considered two primary outcomes. The first was self-report and the second was the latrine observation index discussed previously and reflecting if characteristic signs of latrine use were present. The index could only be measured at the household level, making it somewhat less precise than the self-reported measure. While it was less prone to bias, it is not possible to know who within the house is using the latrine. We used logits for the binary outcome of self-reported latrine use and a standard linear regression for the latrine observation index. In both cases, standard errors were clustered at the level of randomization. The meta-analysis is the portion of the results that we want to focus on here. We did run individual regressions within each state to allow for comparison across states. But what we really wanted to know was, what are the average effects that we could expect to find through these behavior science informed interventions? To answer this question, we pooled the four data sets and ran an additional analysis considering the effects in all four states. In this analysis, standard errors were clustered at the state level and state was added as a fixed effect. So what we find is that self-reported latrine use did increase significantly across time in most states in intervention and control sites. This was what we would expect due to SBN. Importantly, in three of the four states, the increase is larger in intervention sites than control sites. It's the inter interaction effect, the difference in the increase between intervention and control sites that we are showing here. Note that the meta effect is about 0.4, which translates to an odds ratio of 1.5. The results were non-significant for the latrine observation index. There was no consistent temporal trend and there was no difference in the change in index between intervention and control sites. This is likely due to the lack of precision in the measure. If one person in a household of five was using the latrine at baseline and her family members started using the latrine as a result of the intervention, this would not be marked as a change in behavior by the latrine observation index since the household latrine would be a would appear to be in use in both instances. Some other interesting findings were that in all states, women used the latrine more than men and scheduled casts were the group with the highest latrine use. The relationship between age and latrine use varied across states. These comparisons of the patterns of the relationship between demographic characteristics and latrine use across states would not have been possible without the adoption of a consistent measure and a single analytical approach. So in conclusion, we do find that these uh, interventions resulted in an increase in self-reported latrine use, but not an increase in the characteristic signs of, latrine, of the latrine observation index. It was the unique co-design of the four studies that allowed for this comparison of the effects across studies uh, and the calculation of the mean effect. This mean effect is likely to be more generalizable than the results of the individual studies. So finally, I want to thank the participants and the wonderful researchers for their time on this project. This was an incredible undertaking by the research teams and their implementing partners. I would like to thank the PIs of the four projects, Shruti Viswanatha, Hans Moller, Bethany Caruso, and Val Curtis, who recently passed away and had a lifetime of contributing to WASH, WASH research. I know there was a memorial for her earlier in the conference, and her work has been instrumental in moving this field forwards. So at this point, um, please add questions to the chat and I'm gonna go back to my conclusion slide. All right, well, thanks very much uh, for that uh, presentation, really exciting findings. Please do uh, share questions for uh, Charlotte in the chat. And uh, we, ac we actually have a, a few minutes to uh, address any questions that, uh, that you might have on this work. 
Great. Uh, another question from Stephanie about um, the development of the latrine observation index and, uh, and how that was done. Yeah, so we had um, five, five questions that the enumerators were asked to score the, the latrines on. So they would go to actually see the latrine and mark whether or not uh, the latrine pit was clogged, if the latrine was used for other purposes, um, and if cleaning supplies were present, and if um, a water canister was present. And so a uh, household would get scored yes, no for each of these. And depending on the number of these signs that were present, you would end up with a score from one to five. Um, and each person within the household would receive the same score because their household latrine has the same observations. Great. Uh, and another question, I see you have these open as well. Uh, uh, Lauren Alcorn is asking uh, why you think the uh, elderly users in Karnataka and Gujarat might have been uh, more likely to use toilets than uh, elderly folks in Odisha. Yeah, so I think that's a really interesting finding that the pattern isn't the same across states. Um, so I don't think that we know at this point why not. Um, there's more qualitative work that we can look at to get to that question of why these patterns are different. But um, I think that it's important to notice that these potentially cultural or social norms are not the same. And so applying a blanket approach uh, is not appropriate. Great. Uh, and then uh, Louis Borstein is asking, um, you know, and first of all, thanks very much for, um, you know, sort of uh, describing the uh, meta effect and odds ratios, but he's asking in, in just sort of layman's terms, uh, can you say a little bit more about uh, uh, the absolute effect size in terms of how much these interventions impacted the usage of toilets, or any of these approaches significantly more effective than others, et cetera? Yeah, um, so there was variation in the um, impacts across the different sites. Uh, so you can see here this that some of them were more significant than others. One thing that's interesting is that uh, in, for example, Karnataka, the mean effect seems much larger, but the confidence intervals are pretty wide. Whereas in um, Odisha, for example, maybe that mean effect is a little bit smaller, but the confidence interval is much tighter. Um, so we do see variation in the effectiveness across the different, the different states. And in the paper that's coming out um, that they are each publishing separately, you can see uh, more detail about what each of these different states were done. So there's going to be papers on each of these interventions themselves, and you can really dig into what they did and maybe what worked and didn't. That's great. Uh, I hope that was helpful to uh, clarify the question there. Uh, and another question um, uh, from Carol Steinfeld. Uh, in Bihar State, she's wondering, are these strictly pit latrines mostly that you're observing or also a mix of dry and eco-sand toilets? Um, she says, I know the flooding in Bihar has prompted NGOs to discourage uh, pit latrines. Unfortunately, I do not know the answer to that question, and I'm not going to pretend to know something I don't know. So that's something I should be more aware of. All right, well, these are really wonderful questions. Please keep them coming. Um, and uh, uh, Lewis uh, was saying, uh, if you can just say a little bit more in, in sort of simple layman's terms, uh, uh, how much uh, these interventions impacted uh, the usage of toilets. Um, um, so I feel like you want me to give you a percent or something, uh, and I don't have a percent for like <laughs> the percent increase. Uh, well, I, and I can't speak for the, for the question, but I guess I'm wondering, in the universe of all the different things that have been done in sanitation and how well they work uh, uh, relative to uh, basic SBM and relative to all the other sorts of things that are done, how big are these effect sizes uh, in the context of different things folks are trying? I, I, I don't know if, if that, that sort of gets us there to sort of put these effect sizes in a, in a broader context. I don't know if that's a little bit what the uh, uh, question was going to, but I'd certainly be curious to, to hear more on that as well. So uh, this effect size, it's not um, earth shatteringly huge by any means. This is a small inch forward that we're getting it closer, but especially in India right now, where uh, we are expecting to sort of be near the end of the issue, every little bit at the end really makes a huge difference. Um, and this is beyond what SBM was doing alone. So what we're seeing here is 
the effects that wouldn't have been achieved through SDM. Yeah, no, thanks. That's very interesting. And I'll, I'll just sort of take moderator's privilege as well to say, you know, it'd be really interesting to see in terms of an incremental cost effectiveness analysis relative to the cost of basic SBM and, and the, uh, the impact that we're getting um, are some of these things incrementally uh, uh, very cost effective in terms of, of just, as you were saying, getting that little additional bump. I think, I think that would be very interesting. I don't know if that's something you're, you're uh, planning to look at. Um, so each of the four teams, like I said, are publishing their own papers um, and they have their own reports posted on our website about uh, their analyses. And those do include some information on costs. These were all specifically designed to be very low cost, um, but I would encourage you to read the reports about the cost data as well. Great, and I think we have time for one last question. Uh, Darcy Anderson's uh, asking how uh, transferable and generalizable you think these interventions might be across different states. For example, uh, were the uh, interventions uh, implemented in Karnataka, uh, if those were uh, applied in Odisha, would you expect to see similar effect sizes and vice versa? So we have, if you go to the slides at the end, um, you can see uh, the different activities that were actually conducted. They are pretty different activities. Um, and the point of that was to specifically design them to local context. So we did find that the barriers were quite different in the different states. And you don't want to be taking something that works one way and just assuming it's going to work everywhere else. So I would say that you can't take these studies and just apply them. But it's this approach of thinking about the behaviors and coming at it from this idea of behavioral uh, science rather than um, you know, assuming that the limitation is only access or putting these other assumptions on, on your intervention design. All right, well, thanks very much, Charlotte. And uh, I encourage uh, folks to continue to uh, engage with uh, uh, our previous presenters in uh, the chat box. And um, while you do that, uh, we can uh, uh, queue up our uh, uh, final presenter, uh, Bram Means. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> Bram Reams uh, from uh, uh, Action Against Hunger uh, will be presenting work on using barrier analysis and willingness to pay to promote household water treatment in Haiti. Sorry, Bram, I do actually know your name. <laughs> I, know, I know you do, Mike. Can you hear me? <clears throat> I hope you can, because... Yeah, you're coming through great. All right, thank you. Um, so good afternoon all and congratulations for your and, first and sorry Bram, if you're able to just put it in presentation mode i think that might uh, uh make it easier to view some of the content more clearly right because um this is the slideshow here and apologies if, they, if you've already done that and it's coming through slowly one second it's coming up There we go, can you see it? Beautiful, thank you. Right, so thanks Mike for the introduction. Sorry for taking it a little longer on uh, getting the technology right. Um, gonna present today on using barrier analysis combined with willingness to pay uh, to promote household water treatment. We did this in Haiti and you can see uh, the team that worked on this uh, below. Um, to go to the work. am I going to the next slide because this is not really working out like this no we're actually we're back in that edit mode uh we're not in slideshow mode anymore and it's not advancing I'm sorry it may have clicked twice <laughs> I know it's hard toggling between all the screens yeah Okay, yep. Now now we're good. Now we're good. We got your background slide up in full screen. Oh, now we're back to the I'm not sure what's going on there, but if you can manage great and if not, I think we'll just have to uh, uh press ahead either way. Right. Okay. Um This is the screen. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to try and do it like this. Uh that's, uh, that's Great. Already, oh, sorry about that. Um, I'm gonna need. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna have to uh, try to to yeah. Up. Gonna need a couple of slides to try to explain the, the background a bit uh, before we jump to into the study. 
So as you might know, there's been a, a for a very, a very long time cholera uh, outbreak in Haiti, 2010, 2019. So the last outbreak was February 2019. If you want to know more about that, um, uh, you might want to listen into the Tuesday session on Russian outbreak response because we discussed how we responded to it. Um, the initial response was really free distributions of a lot of washed hygiene items that included water treatment uh, and also conservation uh, uh, products like uh, buckets with, with taps or without taps. Um, the water points themselves, there's a low percentage that is, um, that is improved. And a lot of them actually, uh, just over a majority in the Artibonite department, where, which you can see on the map to the left, uh, is actually uh, contaminated. Um, uh, there's not so many people uh, that uh, report treating their water. And if you would, um, uh, this is self-reported. And if you would, would look at other data or collect other data, asking them about, do you have a, can we verify if you have a household water treatment product? in your home or measure uh, chlorine residual, you would uh, see that it's actually much lower. Um, let me try to go. There we go. A little bit of, a couple of words about the timeline. Um, so there's uh, a lot of disasters or, or, or catastrophes that have been hitting Haiti for the last number of years. Uh, you can see then the, the top lines, cholera, break hurricanes, the political uh, instability and COVID-19 hit, of course. And then there's, there's also the policy framework that, that uh, this project, or these projects rather, took place in the National Cholera Elimination Plans, and very important, and also a National Household Water Treatment Strategy, um, which also de determined a bit how we, uh, how we went about this. And then below, you can see a couple of the um, the the main phases that we did and i'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide right so here's a bit of an overview of how our approach changed over the last four years let's say so even back in 2016 um we were doing massive distribution of cholera kits including these uh point of use water treatment products but we were wondering if we were not damaging the market uh, through these free distributions. And so we asked ourselves, can we do this in a, in a different way? And we decided to do a market assessment, focusing on three behaviors. So it was hand washing, water treatment, and water conservation, a number of different products. And one of the findings that was uh, striking to us was that a large number of households we're actually using glenular, glenular chlorine, which is used to, for shock chlorination of water points. It's not uh, intended for household water treatment. Um, and it was actually also forbidden by government. So then we decided to do a small pilot to promote an alternative, uh, which was liquid chlorine. And we saw that the pilot worked uh, absolutely fine. It was, it was a, a big success. The next year, 2018, 2019, we did our first project uh, and we used a combination of vouchers um, and, and still distribution of the liquid chlorine uh, to see if we could use uh, local markets. Still, it wasn't perfect. A lot of people did not have chlorine residual. Uh, there were a lot of stockouts, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so to understand what was really happening we did our first barrier analysis and willingness to pay survey at the end of that project. And then the final phase, as you can see here, 2019, 2020, we expanded to four communes um, and uh, the, we did our, uh, basically we did a second barrier analysis and willingness to pay survey. And instead of doing free distributions, um, we did uh, purely social marketing combined with vouchers who were decreasing in value. Uh, maybe just noting the product itself, it's, it's, it's a bottle of liquid chlorine, it's locally produced, uh, uh, it's available in Haiti, um, uh, and it's certified by the relevant authorities. So now to the study. We wanted to design a social marketing strategy, and we wanted to know how we would need to implement it. And so 
two main questions came out of it. What are the behavioral determinants that influence household water treatment as a, as a regular practice? And um, are people, would people be willing to pay the current market price uh, for it? Um, because we were suspecting that uh, the market price could be an important, uh, an important factor in that. We also actually had a, a, a sub question, which was which method would be most appropriate to measure this uh, willingness to pay? So we did two surveys. One was uh, done at the end of the pilot project in the one com commune. We uh, used this, uh, what a small sample. And then for the first time did combine uh, barrier analysis with willingness to pay survey. We only had female respondents because uh, we knew that females um, would be, uh, would have the highest uh, decision, um, role in decision-making around purchasing. And of course, I mean, households could not have access to a pipe water supply. The second survey we was a bit more uh, professional, uh, larger sample, two-stage cluster. Um, uh, we did both women and men and uh, same exclusion criteria. So to explain how uh, we measured willingness to pay, we define it as the maximum price a respondent would be willing to pay for a, for one of, so for for a bottle, and we used two measures that we compared uh, between uh, uh, each other. The first method was um, stated preference. It's basically it's called contingency evaluation. It's you ask people directly what they would be willing to pay, um, but the obvious risk is that people will overstate their price, of course. So you'd, you'd want to tweak your questions a bit, which is what we did. We would be asking what's a relatively cheap or reasonable price, or what's a rather expensive but still reasonable price. The second approach was um, the uh, BDM approach, where we put people in a real life situation and they could actually buy um, a liquid chlorine bottle. So they have to state their price on a piece of paper and they could by lottery uh, pick uh, a piece of paper and if um, the the price that they took it was below their stated price they would have to buy it this was explained to people before and they would have to consent of course uh, if, the, if the the price tag they took was higher than they stated preference they couldn't buy um, all right so what were the results so these are just a couple of results um, from the barrier analysis uh, of one commune. So you can see that there's quite a few uh, differences here uh, between uh, users and non-users, or users being the ones um, uh, doing household water treatment. Um, and the, the main differences uh, were that users had higher auto-efficacy um, there was differences in social norms. Um, they remembered it better. Uh, risk perception was different, higher satisfaction with the product, um, and so on. So then what's important is that we didn't just see um, commonalities um, between barriers and enables. We also saw important differences. Uh, between the four communes. It's a bit the same as, as the, the previous presentation between differences between states. And sometimes these were, were actually opposite. And you can see in this commune, um, there was non-doers who were more likely to state a distribution for free facilitated use, whereas um, in this commune, it's actually the opposite. Now, continuing, the results of the uh, willingness to pay survey then so not everybody completed the uh, the, the DDM exercise, um, but um, um, we could find no significant differences between those who, One refused, minute. who refused to uh, to play uh, the game uh, and those who did participate. So no differences in income or sex whatsoever. We did find a difference between our two methods. So our BDM exercise was clearly superior and that um, we we found that people were overstating their price when we asked them directly. For a small proportion of the population, price was uh, current market price was definitely too high, so they would never buy it. 
Um, and then there's also some factors associated with higher willingness to pay, such as household income, joint decision making. Uh, when people were making the decision jointly in the household, they would, would be willing to pay a higher price. Uh, and they would also be willing to pay higher prices for door-to-door -door sales. Then again, we saw differences between the four communes. So for example, willingness to pay was very close to the market price in this commune as well as in this commune, because the bottle was 50 Haitian gourd uh, for one bottle. But here you can see that this is uh, really uh, significantly lower. So what I'm hoping is that by now you're starting to see how all of this information is, um, is, 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 is potentially useful to design a marketing strategy. Uh, for example, here um, you, you would see the preferences for uh, sales, uh, where people would like to, uh, prefer to buy it, in the local market pharmacy shop, et cetera, et cetera. So one, one more slide, this is it. So then, based on these findings, we designed a social marketing strategy. And I hope you can see this. Um, we sort of mapped out um, all of the steps that are involved uh, in, in, in uh, household water treatment. So the red ones are the decisions people need to make. And these are all the actions that people need to make. There's quite a few of those uh, that actually involved in the simple process of chlorinating your water. Um, so we designed a marketing strategy, designed around a marketing mix, product place, price, and promotion, and then a communication and sensitization strategy. And uh, as I mentioned uh, in, in the beginning, vouchers for the poorest that decreased in value, and then social marketing uh, to, to promote sales. And we defined our target group as well, who were women with or without children, uh, had access to, uh, had no access to an improved water point, but did have access to uh, uh, a sales point because we found that distance was uh, one of the most important uh, determinants. Right, so that was it. Oh no, yeah, some conclusions. <laughs> so I think um, for us, it was, this was really interesting because it proved that we could combine it easily, barrier analysis with willingness to pay, that it really was informative for a social marketing strategy. Uh, differences between communes, for all the the, the 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 two type for the two types of surveys, so this this allowed us to come up with a targeted strategy. Price was a barrier. Uh, you need staff if you want to really want to implement the social marketing strategy. You need staff who have, have skills in marketing. Um, our major issue during implementation was inflation because the price of the product uh, doubled. Um, and then COVID nineteen, as was also mentioned in the first presentation, hampered. Uh, a lot of what we intended to do, door-to-door -door sales weren't possible anymore. A lot of sensitization activities weren't possible anymore, unfortunately. Thank you very much. And please shoot any questions you may have. All right, thanks very much, Bram. Uh, I know we only have a few minutes left before folks have to get to the next session. Uh, we have one question here from uh, Syed Andrew Islam, who's asking um, whether um, you think you might have gotten different results from the willingness to pay study uh, if, uh, uh, if you hadn't had the initial work uh, with uh, distribution of free chlorine uh, solution. Yeah, uh, um, I, I, I wouldn't be so sure about that because Heidi, uh, due to the cholera epidemic, uh, and so many years of free distributions is really um, uh, is really used to that. Households have seen uh, NGO staff, and community health workers, and everyone coming by uh, once in a while to distribute these these things for free. So um, uh, they're absolutely used to it, and it's the reason why we wanted for a mar uh, we went for a market based approach uh, to reduce this dependency. I hope this answers the question. Great. And we do have time for one last question, if anybody has one. All right. Uh, well, thanks very much, uh, uh, Bram. And thanks very much to all of our three presenters uh, for these uh, wonderful presentations and for the great questions. Uh, I know a lot of you are eager to get to the next uh, session. And please do be sure to uh, Stick around for uh, poster sessions and uh, for trivia later. All right, well, thanks very much again. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, 
stop recording and um, go ahead and close up the room, but please do follow up uh, if you have questions for uh, any of the presenters later on.